coming up. Today's artist was told by one of the founding fathers of rock and roll that he should write a novelty song about a horror movie icon. So he wrote a, a total joke song, one that he actually called a piece of crap. It became his only hit. It's a song about a mysterious, sophisticated gent who could be seen dining at Chinese restaurants and drinking pina coladas in posh areas of Soho and Kent. He's a dapper fellow with uh, tailored suits and perfectly coiffed hair. But don't let appearances fool you. Despite his dashing looks, you better keep your distance because he'll rip your lungs out. The truth behind this hairy-handed, bottle lightning hit and the tortured artist who released the cap then drew blood. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you understand unequivocally the beautiful relationship between a pencil and a cassette tape and how the two have come together to save your life a few times, you're going to love this channel of musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the bell so you never miss out on our interviews. We also have a Patreon. Uh, that helps us keep the daily channel. We'll give you more content. You can become an honorary producer as well. So guess what? It's time for another edition of our series, Bottle Lightning. This is where we celebrate a song or an album that was king for a day, or you know, many days. Here we honor artists and bands that rocketed up the charts, but for reasons unknown, you know, they weren't able to sustain that success. A lot of people call them one-hit wonders. Here we celebrate them as lightning in a bottle. You know, the story of Warren Zevon is, in many ways, an archetypical account of an immensely talented but tortured rock star. Like many before him and after him, he was somehow convinced that genius followed the road of excess. In his own words, he lived the life of Jim Morrison, you know, but for some reason he lived 29 years longer. Warren Zevon was beloved by his peers, a collection of the best artists of the so-called troubadour era of the early to mid 70s. He was a highly sought after session player for many years before the great Phil Everly convinced him to write a song about werewolves, fashioned after the Monster Mash, and the result, of course, was a bottle lightning track that became his only pop hit. Warren Zevon's childhood resembled episodes of The Sopranos, actually. During his formative years, Warren's father, William Zevon, he worked as a bookie uh, who managed volume bets and dice games for the scandalous LA mobster, Mickey Cohen. The Cohen crime family, they gave him the nickname Stumpy Zevon, and he was even the best man <laughs> at Mickey Cohen's first wedding, if you can imagine that. As far back as uh, Warren can remember, Stumpy, he drifted in and out of his son's life, often making a ruckus when he you know, reappeared. Uh, there was a time when Warren was nine years old and his bookie father showed up to give his son a piano uh, that he had actually won during a poker game. Now, Warren was of course thrilled with his father's gift, but his mom was none too pleased and she promptly ordered her erratic husband to remove the piano immediately. Uh, Stumpy responded by hurling a kitchen knife, narrowly missing his mom's head, and then he stomped out of the house. So Warren did get to keep that piano. When Warren was 13 years old, he demonstrated early signs of potential greatness with his piano playing in music class. Uh, he impressed his junior high music teacher so much that he was invited to attend a recording session for the famous Russian composer Igor Stravinsky, who actually asked the teenage prodigy to come over to his home on several occasions. <laughs> Following the legal divorce of his parents uh, when he was just 16, Warren turned full-time to music, forming a musical duo with his high school friend Violet Santangelo called Lime and Sybil. The duo almost broke through with a song called Follow Me, which was actually produced by renowned record man Bones Howe. And actually the single peaked at, uh, eh, not too shabby, number 65 on the Billboard Hot 100. That was in the spring of 66. Now when Lime and Sybil fizzled, Warren immersed himself in the session world and he quickly earned a reputation of being a supreme piano player. 
played keys on a wide variety of recordings, from Linda Ronstadt to uh, Jackson Brown to Buddy Rich to the Turtles. Now, the tipping point for Warren Zevon's success as a solo artist, that traces back to his relationship with Phil Everly of the Everly Brothers. The brothers, Phil and Don Everly, represented one of the most influential acts of the rock era. Really, a lot of people call them uh, one of the founding fathers of rock. But by the dawn of the 70s, the Everly Brothers were well past uh, their prime from you know, 1956 to 1962 is really their prime. The Everly's hired Zevon as their keyboardist, and he gradually ascended to band leader and principal songwriter for the act. Uh, during his stint as band leader for the Everly Brothers, Zevon hired the colorful Waddy Wachtell to be uh, the main guitarist. There was even a point where Lindsey Buckingham played with the Everly Brothers. Now, the general public wasn't aware, but the Everly Brothers had a, a rocky uh, sibling rivalry for many years, and it shattered the breaking point um, after a malicious fight that led to the permanent breakup of the Everly Brothers as a twosome. That happened in 1973. Warren was forced to pick a side, and he chose to go with Phil. We Now, Zevon, his first solo record was 1970's Wanted Dead or Alive. When his debut didn't move the needle at all, Zevon was disillusioned with his career and he moved to Spain for a couple of years. Now, he returned to LA in 75 and he shared a flat with Lindsey Buckingham and his then living girlfriend, Stevie Nicks. Uh, a collaboration and a friendship with Jackson Brown helped Zevon land a deal with Asylum Records and the recording of his second solo album, self titled Offering, released in 1976. Zevon's friends, they were all over this LP. Linda Rodstadt uh, performed on the record along with, there was Bonnie Raitt, there was Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys, members of the Eagles, and all of the members of Fleetwood Mac with uh, the exception of Christine McVie. Keep on riding, 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 riding. Before Zevon's self-titled second album came out in 76, so Phil Everly suggested a a sort of tongue-in-cheek idea for a new song for Zevon. Everly stayed up late to watch the 1935 horror film Werewolf of London on After Midnight TV back in the day. When he saw Zevon the next day, he joked that you know, Zevon should write a song about a werewolf. Now, as we get into that challenge he laid down, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny I Wear the Glasses that I always wear. Zenny has incredible variety. You can get so many you know, different types of glasses from prescription to sunglasses to progressives and on and on and on. But then you get to design your own to your liking. But the best part of it all is the price, especially with inflation rising. You can get a complete pair of prescription lenses, glasses for up to 80% off of regular retail prices, up to 80% off. Make sure that you click on the info button right here. It'll come out and you'll go to get uh, the best price. <laughs> the way Everly described it to Zevon was making a tune that could stir up a dance craze, you know, sort of like Boris Pickett's The Monster Mash. They did the Monster Mash. The Monster Mash. Zevon laughed off the idea, but when he was joined by Leroy Maranel and Waddy Wachtel in the studio, the conversation with Phil came back to him. And uh, Marnell and Zevon were strumming guitars together. And then Waddy walked into the studio and, you know, asked, what are you guys playing? Zevon responded, Werewolves of London, which prompted Waddy to let loose a big old wolf howl. Ah. Now, Warren's wife, Crystal Zevon, she began taking notes while Zevon, Marnell, and Wachtel they just spewed out random lines that made the final lyric sheet. You know, like, I saw a werewolf with a Chinese menu in his hand. Walking through the streets of Soho in the rain. He was looking for a place called Lee Ho Fuchs uh, to get a big dish of beef chow mein. Name checking, uh, actually, a real life Chinese restaurant in London's Chinatown. He was looking for the place called Lee Ho Fuchs. These guys were having a blast, inventing alternative phrasing, such as the line in verse two, little old lady got mutilated late last night. Little old lady got mutilated late last night. 
And it was actually Warren that came up with perhaps the two most memorable lines in the songs. The last part of verse three that says, ha, I'd like to meet his tailor, draw blood. Jim, I'd like to meet his tailor. And in the end of verse four, a phrase that was immortalized by Tom Cruise's character in the Martin Scorsese movie, Color of Money, which uh, came out in 86. The three musicians were not taking the song seriously at all. It was a big joke. The more lines they threw out, the more comical and weird they got. But their collective abilities to craft a song developed some natural rhythm and rhyme, and it came together in about 15 minutes. You know, the trio had a rough narrative for a complete song around a, a Marinell uh, device three chord progression that looped throughout their draft. It didn't seem like the guys had done anything with merit at the time. So Zevon elected not to put the song on this second solo record. Actually just put the project on the back burner. The Zevon sophomore record, it didn't produce a hit, but the collection of 11 tracks uh, consisted of several classic Warren and Zevon compositions. Bo Hammer's Radio. There's Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me, you know, that Linda Ronstadt later covered and made a number 31 hit on the Billboard Hot 100 that happened in 78. Ronstadt also remade Hasten Down the Wind, uh, another cut from Zevon's second LP, and used it as the title track for a seventh album. Uh, Zevon's original version actually included Phil Everly singing harmony, also David Lindley on slide. So he tells her to hasten down the wind. One of Zevon's best deep cuts was the last song on his self-titled album called Desperado Under the Eaves. It's a tune about uh, Warren's rapidly advancing alcoholism. Don't you feel like desperados under the eaves? Now, for Warren's third offering, called Excitable Boy, classic, that came out in 78, he actually dusted off the unfinished Werewolves of London and enlisted the talents of Mick Fleetwood on drums and John McVie on bass, along with the song's co-writer, Waddy Wachtell, providing you know, some outstanding lead guitar parts. How would you like them as their backing band? <laughs> Reminiscing about recording Werewolves of London, Waddy Wachtell called it the hardest song to get down in the studio that he'd ever worked on. He's worked on a lot of songs. He compared uh, recording Werewolves of London to the challenges that Francis Ford Coppola faced while filming the epic movie Apocalypse Now. With Jackson Brown and Waddy producing, the four musicians that played on the song recorded it live. They didn't piece it together after the fact. Waddy claimed that it wasn't easy to get the feel right for the track. It took more than 50 takes before they eventually decided uh, that their first crack of the song was ultimately their best. In spite of the arduous frustration, Waddy executed his solo for the bridge in Well Rules. Just one take. Just one take, amazing. Riding along with the guitar melody of the song is Yvonne's pounding piano chords and his acidic baritone lead vocal. It makes the end of every stanza a punchline, complete with his werewolf howl as a big chunk of the song's chorus. So get this, the three co-writers of Werewolves of London were insulted you know, from an artistic perspective when Asylum Records chose the song to be the lead single from Excitable Boy. Uh, the label's logic perplexed them. Zevon and Wachtel referring to their creation as uh, a piece of crap. That's what they called it. They wanted Tenderness on the Block or Johnny Strikes Up the Band to be the first single. You know, not some comedy piece, a joke that they composed in 15 minutes. Asylum's hunch, though, about Werewolves of London, that was right on the money. Sometimes a record label's right. <laughs> the song was bottle lightning for Warren Zevon. It was his lone pop hit. It busted the number eight in Australia, number 11 in New Zealand, number 18 in Canada, and it went to number 21 on the Billboard Hot 178. Walking with the queen. In pop culture, since its release in 78, the song has become really iconic. Uh, besides the placement in Color of Money, 
Werewolves of London, it was used in the film An American Werewolf in London, of course, and a multitude of TV episodes. I mean, this is just a condensed list, but Hawaii Five-O, Californication, Grim. Actually, during the inauguration ball in 99, Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura made a growling vocal performance of the song with Zevon on the same stage playing the song's famous piano riff. Washington Nationals outfielder Jason Wirth has placed werewolves in his rotation of songs to rev up the crowd over the home stadium PA as he walks up to the batter's box. There are renditions galore of Werewolves of London from Grateful Dead, David Lindley, Adam Sandler. And of course, you've undoubtedly heard the heavy werewolf sampling in Kid Rock's number one smash all summer long that came out in 2008. In in for all the success that the song has generated for Zevon, he denigrated it. Probably wasn't joking around when he you know, begged Rip Torn, who played the producer of Gary Shandling's comedy in The Larry Sanders Show, not to make him play the song when he was scheduled to be a guest performer on this fictitious talk show. Right, right. Well, it's one of Larry's personal favorites. Yeah, well, every single show I do, I play with in London. You know. uh, the bitterness towards his hairy-handed hit, it plagued him because the song was so fundamentally unsound for Warren Zevon. I mean, how could he get fulfillment from a novelty song, a joke about werewolves, when at the core he was such a complicated, haunted, and destructive artist? Like the creature that he sang about, Zevon had physically violent episodes that frightened those around him. But it was his emotional attacks that did the most damage, figuratively uh, ripping the hearts out of those who loved him so. When he was drinking alcohol, his daughter Ariel called her father unbearable, erratic, violent, even emotionally absent. On many occasions in the late 70s and early 80s, Yvon lodged at the infamous Chateau Marmont uh, in Hollywood, sometimes for weeks at a time, checking in with nothing but a 44 pistol and a few bottles of whiskey. The Chateau Marmont was uh, the hotel where, if you remember, John Belushi was found dead from a drug overdose. While he stayed at the Chateau, uh, Zivon seemed determined to go out the same way that uh, Belushi and Jim Morrison had. One of his most notorious benders, Zivon stood out on his balcony, drunk as a skunk, shooting his pistol across Sunset Boulevard, aimed at a billboard of Richard Pryor. His addictions, they continued to escalate until he officially went clean and sober in 1986. In 1987, Zivon had a comeback with the help of Bill Berry, Peter Buck, and Mike Mills from R.E.M., who actually became his studio band for the uh, Sentimental Hygiene album on Virgin Records. The album was praised as Zevon's best since Excitable Boy. One track included backup vocals by R.E.M. lead singer Michael Stipe called Bad Karma. As usual, Zevon's Sentimental Hygiene included all-star guest contributions in addition to the members of R.E.M. The album featured appearances by uh, Neil Young and Brian Setzer, you know, Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers, and even Bob Dylan. In August of 2002, Warren Zevon was diagnosed with an aggressive, inoperable lung cancer. Uh, after his diagnosis, Zevon was a guest on Late Night with uh, David Letterman with a funny, very honest and self-deprecating discussion with David Letterman about his uh, terminal illness. Path and uh, lived like a, lived like Jim Morrison and then lived 30 more years. Who knows what? Letterman was an ardent supporter of this artist. Zevon called Letterman the best friend my music ever had. The boy and the girl. Yeah, yeah, good yeah. for you. Um, and tonight you're going to sing uh, hopefully three songs. The doctors gave Warren three months to live, but he lasted another 10 months longer than they had actually predicted. And he used that time to do what he loved the most, to make music. Now, the result was Warren Zevon's final studio album, The Wind. It turned out to be the most acclaimed creation of his entire career. The album won the Grammy Award for Best Contemporary Folk Album. And his collaboration with the boss, Bruce Springsteen, called Disorder in the House, that was awarded the Grammy for Best Rock Vocal Performance Group or Duo. The earth will open and swallow up the real estate. 
Overall, the win received five posthumous nominations, including Song of the Year for the ballad Keep Me in Your Heart. Keep me in your heart for a while. Warren Zevon died on September 7th of 2003. He was only 56 years old. This was a song that my dad used to quiz me on when I was a little kid. We played this game from the time that I was about six or seven on up. And he'd say, you know, I'll give you a million dollars if you can tell me who sings this song. Since Warren Zevon's last name was so unique, I remembered it the first time I got it wrong. And the next time my dad asked me, I nailed it. I think he was really surprised that I remembered it. I can still remember my dad doing that big werewolf howl. And then, you know, he'd sing it in an imaginary mic, and then he'd hand the mic to me to try to get me to do the howl. It's a, a memory that I still cherish every time I hear this, this amazing song. Werewolves of London was indeed bottle lightning for uh, Warren Zevon, but it wasn't a signature song. I mean, the verdict for what his signature song is will likely always end in a heavily debated hung jury. He has his cult fans, his admiring peers that will cite many different songs that really demonstrate his Yvonne's biting, sardonic genius. He's one of those artists that deserves a complete examination or even a rediscovery of his work. At the end of that musical exploration, one will most certainly categorize werewolves as a you know, a lighthearted anomaly, separated from a long list of unforgiving satire and jaundiced dark humor. It was hard to define Warren Zevon, but I think Bruce Springsteen's assessment is perfectly stated. Springsteen, a friend and a collaborator, describes Zevon as a moralist in cynic's clothing. He wrote beautifully about the good, the bad, and the ugly. You were talking about Bruce Springsteen. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Warren Zevon and this song that became his only hit. Do you think he's way too hard on this classic hit? I do. It's a great song. Go vote for him for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know, what are your memories of this classic hit of his catalog? What are some of your favorite songs? Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you. Check out our merch, our Professor Rock merch, and... Uh, Help us keep the music alive. That's the idea here. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>